His was the only boat to arrive. I think maybe it was a cow. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> There's a thank you letter from Lyndon Johnson. There was even a monorail at one point to the east of us. Plus, everybody forgets about pirates. This is the coolest field trip I have ever been on. I don't know, but I've been told keep on dance for never get old. Hello, and welcome to the Long Island History Project, a podcast that brings you stories and interviews with people passionate about Long Island, New York history. You can hear them all at longislandhistoryproject.org. My name is Chris Kretz. I am your host. And our opening music is courtesy of the Homegrown String Band. I'm recording this two weeks into May, which means that the Major League Baseball season is in full swing. So it's the perfect time to turn our eyes back to a baseball Long Island history topic. We're heading back to the late 30s and the 40s, back to a time when professional baseball was still segregated. We're going to be talking about breaking the color barrier, community baseball, missing memorabilia and municipal employment, and playing for sheer love of the game. And if we're talking Long Island baseball history, you know who's on deck. Next up, today's very special guest. Hi, my name is Fabio Montella. I'm a librarian and history professor at Suffolk County Community College, and I'm also a Long Island baseball historian. And Fabio, welcome back. You are part of the rotation. I'm thinking now we, we, we annually or more than annually, I guess. Uh, but welcome back to talk about your continuing baseball research. Since we talked last, I'm not sure how long ago it was, but in general, how are things going with you? Things are going well. I'm still doing a lot of research. I'm actually in the process of uh, putting together a book about some of the more extraordinary moments in Long Island baseball history, one of them being the one that we're going to discuss today. So uh, I just keep unearthing more and more baseball history in Suffolk County on Long Island, which makes me realize that this is one of those histories that needs to be shared, not just with our population, but population outside of Long Island. The level that you focus on, and, and you tell me how you would describe that level, but is there a lot of written historical sources on it? Have you found? I think it depends on the community. Um, Suffolk County, with their papers and their close-knit populations, I think they kept good records of, of what was happening in the baseball community. So it's it's fairly simple to, I shouldn't say simple, but it, it's doable where you can unearth a lot of this, uh, this research. Some research requires a little more finesse, um, but other parts of the country where, you know, records or newspapers weren't as as keen on keeping records of, of local baseball or semi-professional baseball, that history is a little harder to to navigate and, and piece together. But I, again, I think we're very fortunate here on Long Island where our newspapers and our uh, past was well documented. And just in terms of historians writing about topics in baseball, other than sort of the, the big picture, you know, the Ty Cobbs things, you know, what, what's the most, or do you have examples of, of a niche historical work that, you know, you know, someone else has published like a, the, a history of minor league ballparks or, I don't know, ticket takers or, you know, in, in terms of diving into more of these. Um... Yeah. Minor league ballparks, I, I think, are a big one when it comes to, to, to local histories. So that's, I think, been well documented and there's been some, some, some good publications out there. But in terms of community baseball, I think this is more of a, a recent phenomenon where historians are looking at their own communities and, and trying to piece that together and, and, you know, make connections or parallels to what happened on the national stage. Great. And so we're sort of warming up to the topic. So is, is community baseball, is that sort of the the term in the field that's a, that's come up? Community baseball is what a majority of, of individuals in the field refer to it. Um, semi-professional baseball is another one, but community baseball is really what I think uh, has sort of been the title that has been given to it. And um, this particular history uh, about Ralph Bunn and the Brookhaven Town Highway 9, this actually came about because of the national history. I, uh, I've studied the Negro Leagues and baseball history, and it's just something that's always fascinated me. And of course, you can't talk about baseball history in the Negro Leagues without inevitably um, bringing up Jackie Robinson. Now, Jackie Robinson breaks the color barrier in 1947 on a national stage. All of America witnesses this, and uh, you know, it becomes obviously front page news. But at that time, when this happens, um, we realized that it was just one instance in the major leagues. And that was 1947. It wouldn't be until 12 years later that every major league team had signed at least one black player, therefore integrating. The last, of course, being the Boston Red Sox 
12 years after Jackie Robinson signs, they signed Pumpsy Green, a, a very well-known, skilled player who signs with the Boston Red Sox. And um, as I'm, I'm hearing about this and just being fascinated by it, uh, the Na- Negro League National Museum, Bob Kendrick, their president, was referencing this. And that museum, which, by the way, does great work, um, they have an exhibit called Barrier Breakers. And it sort of referenced every African-American who became the first on every major league team. From Jackie to Pumpsy, I believe, was the headline of this this uh, exhibit. But as I'm, I'm reading about this and viewing it, um, someone makes a comment of, you know, barrier breakers took place throughout the country, not just at the national level, even within small pockets of community baseball, especially down south, somebody had to be the first. And I said, well, that's an interesting concept where segregation was prevalent throughout the south. And, you know, we still have segregation in the north. You know, obviously it's not uh, legal. It's de facto. But somebody had to break these color barriers that were within the community as well. Because Jackie Robinson breaking the color barrier on the national stage doesn't mean that everybody follows suit and says, well, now that Jackie broke the color barrier, let's all get together and play baseball. Because that's obviously not the way it worked. Um, so it made me think of who was our Jackie Robinson, which it became, believe it or not, the title of a, a, a paper that I published in the Nine Baseball Journal, who was our Jackie Robinson. And it spoke about this history that I'm going to present today, but it also sort of pushed others who read it to think about their own community and who might have been the barrier breaker in in that community. In terms of community level, so like uh, Sandlot Leagues or, or, you know, team leagues within a local community, were they as segregated? Like, or, or were there maybe blacks and whites playing together and didn't really think of it, you know, it's just going for a beer and playing a game every Saturday. But you, you can tell me as, as we get deeper into this. Yeah, of course. Let me start by saying that there was segregation in Suffolk County baseball. I mean, there still is a lot of, of segregation in Long Island today. Again, it's de facto, it's just a lot of separation, whether it's cultural or, or whatnot. We still have a lot of color barriers in our communities. But back in, in, the, in the mid-20th century in baseball, there was a fairly defiant line as to black and white baseball. I mean, we had African-American baseball teams on Long Island who were in the paper called black teams. They were called a, a Negro Nine. Whatever term they were using, they were there was a distinction that they were African-American ball clubs with only African-American players. Of course, the white teams, you, you would never have to reference that this is a white ball club because they, that was sort of the thing. There was our white teams. And then when there was another team, if they happen to be black, the papers would have to mention, oh, by the way, this is an African-American baseball team. So even at the community level, the neighborhood level almost, it was still apparent that there was white white teams. And if a black team came in, you played them, it was sort of a a distinction that a uniqueness that they would note it right that it was not yes ab- absolutely they would they would note it in the papers or, or even if they were advertising it that uh you know the bridgehampton white eagles against the negro nine or, or the all black suffolk giants that distinction would always be made but for the most part it was it was friendly competition much like we would see on the national stage with the negro leagues and these black ball clubs that were barnstorming professionally across the country most of the time they would play other white teams. I mean, you rarely saw a black team versus another black team. Obviously, within the Negro Leagues, yes, you'd see that. But when they started barnstorming outside of the Negro Leagues, much of the competition was black versus white, which is a lot of what we saw here on Long Island. So who you've brought to us today, Ralph Sammy Bunn. So how, how do you want to start? Do you want to set the scene or just dive right into Ralph's history? Of course, yeah. So I'll, I guess I'll set the scene. So I... Uh, As I referenced before, we were talking about barrier breakers and how um, there was sort of this push to try and find the first barrier breakers within our own communities. And I I was very curious as to who was the first in Suffolk County. I started digging around a little bit and I came across um, about a decade after Jackie breaks the color barrier, there was a a team on Long Island called the Setauket Athletic Club. And the Three Village Historical Society has a beautiful piece on how the Setauket Athletic Club Uh, sort of merges with the Suffolk Giants, black team and a white team come together. And it's the first time on Long Island that we see two clubs integrate. Uh, It was a a barrier breaker in its own regards, but it wasn't as if one player joined a white team and thus breaking that barrier. 
it was a black team and a white team coming together to form one club, which would ultimately become the Setauka Athletic Club. A lot of prominent players on that team, one of them being Carlton Edwards, who I had the opportunity to speak with. And, but this happened again about a decade after Jackie Robinson. And, and with all due respect, it is a very prominent history, but it seemed to me a little late in the game. A decade after Jackie Robinson, I said, well, is this really the first time that Suffolk County came together? Um, so Carlton Edwards, he's still with us. He's in the Suffolk Sports Hall of Fame. He's an elderly gentleman. Wonderful pitcher during the time. I think he was probably one of the top black pitchers on Long Island. And I got to speak with him just to talk about the merging of these two teams. And as I'm doing that, I'm also doing some other research on the side. And I come across a picture of a team from 1940 called the Brookhaven Town Highway 9. Now, of course, this has been digitized in black and white. And it looks as though a few players on that team, two of them to be specific, seem to be African-American. But it's hard to tell because the picture is very grainy. And I I don't want to assume that anybody is African-American just by their physical appearance, especially in a black and white photo from a 1940 newspaper. So I, I speak to him and ask me if he knew about this team. And he shows me a picture of the Setauket Athletic Club, the team that merged. And black and white players are in this picture. He had it sort of in his profile that he was saving. And he shows me an older gentleman standing in the back row of this team photo. And he points to that gentleman. And then he points to another gentleman in the 1940 photo that I showed him. He said, that's the same gentleman. I said, so are you familiar with who this gentleman is? And he said, absolutely. That's my uncle. So, of course, that sort of got the ball rolling. And I started asking more questions and doing more research. And I started to uh, find out who this gentleman was. And his name, of course, is Ralph Sammy Bunn. Ralph Bunn Sammy was sort of his nickname. Now, Sammy Bunn, or Ralph Bunn, as I'm going to recall him today, was a, a prominent athlete in high school. Basketball, track, and of course, baseball. But he was peppered all over the Long Island papers as being a star athlete. And when he graduates high school, he comes to play for this, at the time, the Suffolk Giants. They had yet to integrate with the white team. So they were still called the Suffolk Giants, who were a powerhouse black ball club during that time. So he plays with them for maybe about a season or so, from what Carlton tells me. And we're in the early 40s, or just put him in in a time frame for us? Yeah, this is uh, probably the late late 30s, about 36, 37. He's joining this team. Uh, And this is after he had a very successful high school career, because he played for his high school team uh, in Setauket which was also an integrated team. Believe it or not, him and his brother and another um, African-American student were on that team. So that was very rare that we see that on a baseball team in in high school. But he's just a phenomenal pitcher. So he does very well in high school, graduates from high school. And as much was the case, if you were an African-American star baseball player and you graduate from high school, you tend to play for one of the black Long Island teams. And he just happened to play for the best black team at the time, the Suffolk Giants. So as he's pitching on the Suffolk Giants, again, he's building up this sort of image of himself as this star pitcher, because now not only is he peppered throughout the papers in high school, now people in the community level are starting to see just how good he is as he's playing for the Suffolk Giants. And as he's playing for the Suffolk Giants, again, for about a season or so, the Brookhaven Town Highway, they're forming a team which is competing in a lot of local leagues. There was about maybe three or four leagues that were, were prominent during that time. And the Brookhaven Town Highway 9, or the Highway Men, as they were known, were playing for one of this league. And of course, they have aspirations of winning a championship. So they approached Sammy Bunn and asked him if he wanted to play for the team. Now, the caveat was, if you play for the team, we will give you a job on the highway department, which, you know, even today, it's, 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 a, very, it's a very good position to have. And uh, for someone just out of high school playing baseball and probably not many prospects ahead, he jumps at the opportunity. He takes the, the job with the Town Highway 9, and he ends up being the pitcher for the team. And, of course, he goes on to great success with that team, uh, ultimately bringing them a championship. Um, I think he only pitched for about two or three seasons, but during that time, he, I think, led the league in, in wins, strikeouts. He just sort of dominated with that team, again, bringing them that championship that they wanted and sort of eluded them. Um, a little bit about Sammy. Let me let me just backtrack. So he lived his entire life in Setauket. Uh, he did identify as Native American, although obviously also identified as African-American. Served in World War II, um, 
twice married. He has two children, one of which I still speak to often and provided me a lot of history about him. Um, and he played baseball for many years. So he, this short amount of time that he was on the Brookhaven Town Highway is prominent because it was during that time that he breaks that color barrier. Now, keep in mind, when the Brookhaven Town Highway Department brought him on, I don't think they even realized what was happening. I don't think they realized the significance of that moment. Maybe they weren't aware that nobody else had an African-American player on the team. But bringing him in, as far as I can tell, and, and verified also by his nephew, who is a very respectable member of the Satorka community, he became the first African-American to play on a white team. So the, the Brookhaven Highway team, like you were saying, is made up of employees of, of the town on the highway department. Yes. And up to that point, it had been all white. It had been all white. And, and the team wasn't in existence that long. It was only for a few years. Okay. So yeah, they bring him on and he becomes the first African-American to break this color barrier in the community or semi-professional community of Long Island. Now, I say the, the earliest verifiable because it's quite possible that even tomorrow someone discovers that another African-American prior to, to Ralph Bunn broke this color barrier. Personally, I don't think there was anybody earlier. Carlton Edwards, he was adamant that Ralph Bunn was the first. My research points him as being the first. Again, there's no earlier record. And like I said, at that time, it wasn't something that I think they were aware of. In terms of the family stories, they sort of passed on the idea that he was the first. Did you see any actual like headlines of you know, first black player appears on Brookhaven Highway. His family, even when I when I did this research and I approached their family, they thought that I just wanted to do the research because of how great of a player he was. And yeah, he was an excellent player. During those few years that he was at his peak, he was considered, I think, the greatest pitcher on Long Island. The papers were really highlighting him as that. And the family, they they had no idea that he was the first at the time either. So when I when I told them, they were a little surprised. Uh, especially since Ralph Bunn was very quiet about his baseball career. He never really spoke to his his son or his daughter about it. And he never said that he was the first. So it was something that I think was very, uh, very surprising to them, but also I think very honorable for them and, and rightfully so. No, that that's great. And do, do you have any sense of, you know, if, if you think to the Jackie Robinson story, the, the amount of animosity and, and challenges, did you get any sense on any particular challenges Ralph faced either with other opponents or the fact that he was black on this team? There was no mention of any of that. Even his family said that they were very well respected on, on the baseball field. His his nephew, I should say, his family, again, didn't speak much of, of his baseball, but they said he never made any comments or, or any stories of him facing any discrimination within the community. I think he was well-respected, well-liked, um, not just as a baseball player, but as an individual. I mean, he was served in World War II, a, was a good community man. Um, same thing with his nephew, Carlton Edwards. He said he never once had any instances on the baseball field or any signs of disrespect simply because of his color. I mean, the only thing that we might view as disrespectful nowadays, but you have to put historical context into it, is whenever he would pitch, um, the papers would reference him as the colored pitching sensation or the, the Negro ace. But again, that just stems back to them having to point out that, hey, look, this player happens to be black. And I think that has a lot to do with that sort of uh, de facto segregation that they were experiencing at that time. And, you know, before we go deeper, you mentioned his ability as an athlete. So what, what would you say about him as a player? What did you learn about his style or his record or, or his pitching repertoire? He was a, a power pitcher. He would often go deep into games. And again, the papers would often call him the colored ace, the cal colored mound magician. Uh, he was known for throwing no hitters, uh, shutouts. So he was uh, really a sort of, of their pitching sensation. And when they ended up winning that championship again in 1939, he was their ace throughout the season and was on the mound in the game that clinched that championship. So yeah, he was, he was uh, let me put it this way. He was actually approached by the Negro Leagues afterwards or during that time. I was going to ask you that, right? So was, was that an option? Do you think he was scouted or he could have played at that level? I think he could have. And then when I asked his nephew, I said, why didn't he jump at that? He said he wasn't willing to give up a job with the town highway department and go play or try out for the Negro Leagues, which wasn't guaranteed uh, to last or even make the team. So, I mean, he was a family man. He, he had a, a wife and kids, so he probably figured 
if I try out for the Negro Leagues and I don't make it, I just left my job in the highway department, you know, and you're not guaranteed to get it back, I would assume. So I, I think he stuck with the safe bet. I, and I was going to mention there was no DH, so he was hitting too, right? And he, I think he was a pretty good hitter. Yeah, he was a very good hitter. I, I mean, he he was probably what we would consider a five-tool player. He was uh, he was fast. He played defense. He could hit. Uh, he had a, a good baseball IQ from what I was uh, reading as well. Even later on when he played for the uh, uh, the Suffolk Giants, that was later on in life. We're talking 58. You know, you can see in the picture he's an elderly man, but um, – he still could hit and, and play defense well for them. Yeah, I mean that that longevity speaks volumes. I think. Um, do Do you have any sense of what he would have been doing for the highway department, like the actual labor or, or position? That I don't know. And believe it or not, I actually went to the archives for the town of Brookhaven to see if there was any mention of this. And I, I spoke to the uh, the archivist there, and she went through all her records. There was actually no record of the town highway team in their archives. I don't know if it was something that maybe the players did on their own or maybe it was sponsored, but it wasn't, they didn't keep any sort of receipts or any records. Maybe it was just kind of done out of pocket and say, here, here's some money, go start your team. So yeah, when it comes to his connection to the Brookhaven town highway, um, there's very little there to, to sort of look through. And it, But just now that I know the phrase community baseball, this fascinates me. And I know, the one thing I found is that the um, the Brookway Haven Highway Department, they lose one year to the Huntington Police, I think. So, you know, these, I'm not going to call them strange teams, but unique organizations that create teams. So you've talked a little bit, but can you paint a picture again of, of how these leagues, you know, were they all, are they all kind of ad hoc or were they pretty well established and there was a circuit of, you know, your, your league is over here and they have, I don't know if they have drafts, but how much structure was there to these leagues? Um. It depends. At times, it seems like there was good structure, um, but then years later, you might see a league fold and another one sort of come in. There wasn't much in terms of um, regulation as how you were to join the league. I think you would probably put together a team and maybe just sign up for it. There could have been a, a little more structure. I know the league that the highway men were in was called uh, the Suffolk League, <laughs> you know, and I think there might have even been another Suffolk League with the same title at, uh, at a different point, the Sunrise League. But, but the structure was was very loose, and especially with the players and the teams, it gets a little murky when you start to talk about community baseball and semi-professional baseball. Is there a hard line between them, or do they kind of blur? Well, community baseball sort of encompasses everything because it's every team or every league within our community. Semi-professional means that they're not full-time players. You know, Professional players such as Mike Trout or, or Derek Jeter, they, they obviously got paid to play baseball. That was their career, their, their work. Uh, semi-professional, you might have someone who's a plumber during the day and then, you know, play for us nights and weekends and they might get some money here and there. So they're semi-professional. They're not, it's not their majority income or their majority line of work, if you will. So in these leagues, you had some teams like the highwaymen who, you know, they worked for the highway department. They probably, or most likely weren't getting paid to play baseball. They were just there because they were part of the team. Same thing with the firemen or the police teams. Um, but then when you look at teams like um, the Riverhead Falcons, they were paid by uh, Tony Wiftchar. He paid them to play. So they were semi-professional, but those teams would play in the same league. So it wasn't required. You didn't have to necessarily have a semi-professional team to join the league. It just had to be a team of men willing to play baseball in that league at that time and make the games. And again, his longevity sticking with playing this after hours and the commitment it would have taken again, I think speaks volumes about his um, commitment to the game. Yeah. And um, he only played three, three seasons with the Brookhaven town highway. Again, three very good seasons. He was the star for that. And he wins his championship in 1939. But then after that, he, he, for some reason is no longer part of the team and he's no longer a member of the town highway department. Uh, now I asked his son, did he quit? Was he fired? Was he laid off? And all his son knows is that he uh, he, ha he held several jobs throughout his life, and that just happened to be one of them along the way. So I, I don't know the history of why he, uh, he was no longer with that department. But it sounds like he always found a team to play on. Yeah, I think when you had talent, uh, <laughs> I think the other teams all saw you, so he was always playing. I think that was his 
well, I, I know that was his only stop with a white team. Uh, those three years that he played with the Highway Nine, the Highway Men, and then he would he went back to the the, the black circuit on Long Island. I think he he's probably spent the majority of his playing years with the Suffolk Giants. Which is interesting that that could contribute to the relative obscurity or or the family not thinking necessarily that he was that barrier breaker because he did it for three years and then it was just him another job or you know another team he played on not thinking it was such a social uh, implications of it maybe. No, I, I don't think he did either. And um, the local papers never really mentioned him being the first, but they were they were well aware that again he was a black player on a white team because that was something that. Whenever he pitched, he would say the highwayman's black ace. And then I think being that it wasn't something you saw every day during that time, that was probably another reason why these papers were very, very poignant to point this out. Now, just another thread. You had mentioned his Native American roots, and I know the, the Bun name is connected to the Shinnecox. So can you say a little more about that? Because that's an interesting complication to the story or, or you know, nuance to the story where he was also more presenting himself or thinking of himself as Native American, and yet that's not mentioned in the press necessarily, right? No, not during that time. Later on, his son, um, even to this day, is making everyone aware of um, recognition that is as well deserved for the, for the Shinnecock Nation. I mean, the Buns were the first or the original family for the Shinnecocks on Long Island, um, all the way back to um, on, on Ralph Bunn's mother's side. So, which would be his great great grandfather was Dr. Uh, Levi Phillips, who's a, a well known Indian medicine man from the Connecticut tribe. And I, I think he's been well documented. I think Newsday even did a, a cover piece on him one time through his family ancestry. So, yeah, it's, uh, there, there's a strong connection there. Uh, the Bunn family, of course, not just the Talkets, but also uh, the Montaukets, uh, Connecticut tribes, a strong connection with the Native American population here on Long Island. Have you seen. Any research into not even just on Long Island, but in other areas in terms of community baseball and a possible indigenous connection, like uh, Native American teams, or have you, have you seen a strand of that being researched or brought to light? I haven't seen that, but I wouldn't be surprised if there's something out there that has yet to be on unearthed about it. Uh, especially um, again with you know, looking at at the Bun family and and their connection to baseball. Carlton Edwards is a member of of the Bun family and his connections. Uh, to Native Americans on Long Island, um, you could probably make the argument that most of the the Suffolk Giants had some connection or, or some ancestry when it comes to Native Americans. It'd be interesting to see if there was any team that specifically referenced themselves as a Native American baseball team rather than a black or a white baseball team. Right, and and I would shudder to think how the newspapers would have hand, handled the coverage of that, just knowing the tropes they used. But just in in terms of maybe talking about the research a little more, and by chance I happened to re-listen to our interview where where you had talked about meeting Gloria from the the women's baseball team in on Long Island. So how much genealogy did you wind up doing, and and can you talk a little bit more about talking and working with the family, and particularly like what artifacts or records they've got from uh, Ralph's career? Well, Ralph Jr. was really the the family member that helped out the most. Um, I shouldn't say the most. Him and Carlton Edwards, probably the two of them, were the most informative when it came to this research. Ralph Jr. Uh, had a plethora of photos. He sent me so many photos. He sent me the grave site. He, he sent me a lot of information about their Native American ancestry. Uh, Carlton Edwards, I think, being the, the baseball guy that he is. And, and let me just point out that Carlton Edwards was another phenomenal pitcher, uh, both of these gentlemen, Sammy uh, Ralph Bunn and Carlton Edwards, are in the Hall of Fame. But Carlton Edwards provided me with so much information about black baseball during this time, especially black baseball pertaining to the Bunn family and, and, and his family as well, I mean, he being his nephew. But when it came to the genealogy, there's only so much that Ralph could get me. So I, I went and uh, I, I've been working with Diane Habistraw from Connectquat Library. I don't know if you're familiar with Sure. She's uh, she's great at what she does, and uh, probably a good time for me to say thank you for for everything that she's done, and sort of you know give her her flowers right now that she's uh, <laughs> just a wonderful genealogist, and uh, she was able to to look at the Bun family and trace it back to um, again. I think she went as far back as uh, might even went back to Levi Phillips, I believe. No, it's great. And the heartbreaking story that you related with Gloria was that someone had made off with one of her uniforms. So, did you see any? 
Brookhaven Highway jerseys or did he have any, I don't know, trophies or, or mementos? No, and I, and I did ask both uh, Carlton and Ralph Jr. if they had any memorabilia, even a baseball, anything sort of to tie to Sammy Bunn. Even for the Hall of Fame, it would have been nice. They didn't have anything. I actually ended up going on eBay saying, let me see if there's anything. Uh, I did find a Riverhead Fireman's Department baseball uniform that they were selling on eBay. Ah, okay. So, you know, it, it, that was still a connection to this this uh, golden era of community baseball, again, the mid-20th century when we had – couple of leagues and just a a bunch of teams competing for these titles but to answer your question no no memorabilia that i that i could tie to all of this and just to to mention you know you've been mentioning the i guess it's the suffolk hall of fame we're really alluding to right and that's a shout out to chris vaccaro and the group that keeps that suffolk county hall of fame sports hall of fame going suffolk sports hall of fame absolutely uh, and, and also one one other side note that i do want to mention uh, when we talk about the black baseball teams on long island as far as I can tell, they didn't have their own league, so they would sort of just kind of play against or barnstorm against these other local white teams. But it'd be interesting, the town highway department, when they win their championship, do they go up against a local black team, and what was the result there? Do, do they pitch it as, hey, our champion wins or loses to whatever black team they were playing at the time? Uh, there's just a, a lot of uh, intersection going on between again, the black and the white teams and, and the black and the white communities during this time. We've talked in the past about stadiums. So is there anything you want to say about where these teams were playing or were they kind of using high school fields or were there, were there sort of existing community stadiums for a while that these teams would come in and take over? Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't use the word stadiums when we think of stadiums, maybe. <laughs> okay, yeah. <laughs> uh, there are a lot of ball fields, um, very nice ball fields. Even with Char Stadium, which we've spoken about in the past, uh, I put quotation marks around the word stadium because it was basically an eight-foot fence surrounding the field with a concession stand. Uh, But yeah, they would play at local high school fields, but there were also community fields that were just meant for these games. Uh, Some of them still exist today, and they're being used by the community just to play friendly games of baseball or kids to play baseball on. But yeah, that's usually where they would take place. And uh, one piece of information I just want to jump way back on that. I forgot that original picture that I looked at, the black and white 1940 picture, um, where I see these, what look to be three African-American gentlemen. I find out through my research that obviously the one in the back was Ralph Bunn. He was standing in the back row. Uh, the gentleman kneeling in front of him to his, uh, his left, again, another African-American gentleman, Charlie Sells, a great player on the Brookhaven Townway to Town Highway. Once Ralph Bunn joins the team, he brings Charlie with him. So by bringing him along, Charlie becomes the second person, the second African-American to play on a white team in Suffolk County. And the third African-American is actually a a child. It's the Bat Boy, and it's Charlie Sell's son. I believe uh, his name is Charles Sells Jr. Uh, And they refer to him as the team mascot, uh, but he's the the Bat Boy. And there's actually two Bat Boys in the photo, and I'm sure Chris will probably put this on, on the podcast when you post it. But just the look of the white bat boy looking at the black bat boy as if, why is he sitting next to me? Uh, Just the look of uh, bewilderment on his face. Um, And again, I guess that just speaks to the time as well. Anything we haven't mentioned? Anything about the research or or the experience or anything that you want to get down? Yeah, I just, I mean, I did find out a lot about uh, Ralph Bunn's life later on. He um, passed away in 1982. He lived a long life. He never left to talk it. He loved the community. He loved Long Island. He was a, a diehard Long Islander. He was a strong family man later on in life, you know, joining bowling leagues, bowling with his son and his daughter. So uh, I'd like to say that he was very content with life. And I, th- I think baseball being just one of those chapters in his life that he loved as well. And I think he was very happy that it, it happened. And I think his family is, is very happy that his story is, is being remembered. And thank you again to Fabio. Always great to have him on. Keep an eye out for his book. We'll keep you posted, too. That's going to be a great addition to anyone's Long Island history bookshelf. You can find links to related resources in our show notes. That's at longislandhistoryproject.org. If anyone listening has any information, has crossed paths, or has a family member or a story to tell about 
Ralph Bunn, the Suffolk Giants, the Brookhaven Highwaymen. You'll find links to get in touch with Fabio, help him put the pieces together. Always great when these local level stories see the light of day. And if you want to hear your story told or you have a family connection or your own research into Long Island history, Nassau or Suffolk, North Shore or South Shore, get in touch with us. We'd love to talk to you. You can reach us at Long Island History Project at gmail.com. That does it for another episode. Our outro music is Capering by the Blue Dot Sessions, used under an Attribution 4.0 international license. And as always, thank you for listening.